Thank you for coming to another Flyer webcast. We're very excited to share some uh, some theories with you, and um, thank you for coming along. So the name of this presentation is the Amazonification of Finance and how to stand out in the attention economy. So what that means is uh, we've been do doing over 200 digital events over the past year and a half. The world has definitely changed. Um, we would like to share some of our theories from some of the data that we've collected and just some of the observations that we've made. And we think it's really important for people to, to, to accept this and understand that we're now in the attention economy and how important it is to stand out. So today it's uh, myself, Jeremy Johnson, head of FinTech and Emerging Technology for Flya, and Michael Corselli. Would you like to give a little brief about yourself? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Mike Corselli, um, chairman and founder of Flya. Um, I started out in Wall Street over 20 years ago working for UBS in a dual role, um, advising high net worth uh, family offices um, and allocating to external managers. Um, so in 2006, I started a macroeconomic hedge fund, um, you know, seeded the general partnership, um, uh, raised limited partnership money and bet on a a collapse in the financial market. Uh, that was the beginning of my career in private funds. Uh, since then, I've uh, started a couple of different special purpose vehicles, private equity funds, direct lending funds. Um, so a lot of what we're talking about today is uh, the digitalization of part of the capital raising process or due diligence process, depending on which side of the equation you're looking at it from. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Jeremy. Yes, and just a little bit about my experience. I am what you would call a tech guy. Uh, my background is information technology, uh, primarily in digital ads, uh, live streaming, financial technology. And what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of, Michael and I, we, we have a lot of the same conclusions, but we arrive at them from a different vantage point. So what you're going to see today is us talking about the issues that we think are important and kind of our comparing, contrasting, where we agree and where we disagree. And we hope you're able to, to get some really good insights from this. So also, we'd like to invite you to check out our site, www.events.flyer.org. Obviously, you've been there. That's how you register for this event. But check it out. We got a lot of great events coming up. Uh, we got a packed uh, Q4, uh, a lot of good events coming. So we look forward to seeing you at those as well. So. Here's an overview of what will be discussed today. The world has changed and isn't going back. Digitalization has changed finance forever. People crave information discovery via fresh formats. Experience and formal education can hinder openness to new trends and opportunities. And we think narrative now matters more than returns. So with the, the fact that the world isn't going back to normal, what we've seen is that many of the new trends are bottom up versus top down. Uh, traditionally with finance, a lot of the trends were coming from the wealthiest and trickling down. And we have an idea, or I have an idea, Michael may have a different idea, that uh, finance is gonna be changed from the bottom up. Um, we also know that now information is free and open. And I, would, I tell people all day, you know, YouTube is now the largest private school on planet earth. So if there's something that you wanna learn, uh, it can be learned online. Often Michael and I disagree on this point, um, particularly when it comes to finance. But I think that with some of the things like uh, AMC and GameStop, uh, a lot of these online channels have flattened um, information and learning when it comes to finance. And so I'll turn it to Michael and say, what do you think about the fact that uh, the trends are now emerging from the bottom versus the top? How do you see that as a, as a hedge fund manager? Um, well, my, um, my views have been shifting. You've been changing my views gradually over time. Um, you know, I guess I'm going to put it back on you. What would okay. you, what would you rather have an MBA from Harvard <laughs> or a million Instagram followers? Right. And, so, and why? So this was a question posed in the office about two weeks ago. I would say categorically, I would much rather have a million 
Instagram followers than a degree from Harvard at this point. Uh, the reason being is with Instagram or YouTube, you have a following which can be monetized. And so if you're able to monetize 10% of those followers, you can make a sizable return. You can probably make a nicer return than you can as some, greater than some current financial professionals. Uh, I just saw a couple articles about a couple who are on TikTok and they're offering financial education to millions of followers and they're making sizable returns of several hundred thousand dollars a month. Um, I think the world has shifted and, you know, it's, it's interesting because I'm not even sure if these people are licensed financial advisors. I know that makes a lot of people nervous, but uh, it's just the reality of where we are. So what about you? Would you rather have a Harvard degree or would you rather have a million followers on Instagram or YouTube or TikTok? I definitely rather have the MBA from Harvard than um, a million followers on Instagram. Uh, that's definitely where you and I uh, disagree, um, but it, it's true that this, these, um, these podcasts, these blogs, these uh, private um, uh, networks of information uh, have become extremely valuable, and mining them uh, and having the skill sets to tap into the right sources of information which is, and that's a skill in, in and of itself, um, being able to vet your sources of information, and, um, a credible versus somebody who's not very credible, um, somebody who's providing good information versus somebody who's providing an actionable uh, banter. Um, you know, that can be extremely uh, valuable. And I guess filtering, is sort of what it's all about. And that's the challenge that everybody has today is who to listen to. Right. And from the asset manager's perspective, how to have their message heard um, when there's so many different messages that they're competing against. And some of the messages may not be the greatest from a, a financial perspective. Right. Uh, and like, may not be based on very good best practices it may right. not be based on best practices but it's entertaining um it's entertaining and it's free and it's open um so you know youtube i i read an article where people stay on for nine minutes plus watching watching a video uh -huh. Um, which is much longer than, you know, some of the other social media networks where you can watch video content. Um, so it's interesting that you put, you're the first person I saw on YouTube is now the largest private school on planet earth. So a quick question. I mean, because I heard a stat that was saying, basically we've created like more information or we're now creating more information in like days or months than all the information that was recorded previous to the internet. Um, I need to go back and check what the exact statement is, but I want to ask you if you had to say or take a guess on how much the world's information actually weighed um, from a physical perspective, what would your guess be? I don't know. Um cargo ship you know one of the super cargo ships full of information uh the weight of it uh i don't know hundreds of thousands of tons <laughs> yeah i mean that was my initial thought i mean we're talking about if you're looking at you know stone hinges all the way <laughs> to the roman empire to world war ii Plus the stuff we're creating today. I mean, that's a lot of data. Uh, the actual answer is it's the size of a strawberry. <laughs> Which <laughs> just goes to show a hey, how. So information does have weight. Is that what you're basically saying? And yeah. it weighs the same amount as a strawberry. Absolutely. All right. So is it fair to say that digital is more efficient than analog? Absolutely. So virtual is more efficient than in person absolutely 
there's just so much more you can do. And this strawberry is just showing you, I mean, the amount of mass that this strawberry is taking up, but the amount of power trapped inside is just unfathomable. And it's only going to grow. Imagine when it's the size of a grapefruit. Imagine when it's the size of a watermelon, the things that we'll know as humans. I mean, it's remarkable that that statistic. Um, so do you think that you can perform uh, due diligence or market a fund effectively without leaving your physical location? Absolutely. I think that that's, I mean, you and I have heard it from some of the investors on the platform. I mean, well, before they would have to fly and go to conferences and meet a variety of people. Now they're able to tap into various webcasts in a day, go on Discord channels, read subreddits, read Instagram, and read a variety of sources. And it's almost like investors are building out their own uh, streams and sources of data to do the due diligence process. You can do the phone calls. You can hire experts to help you interpret what some of these uh, groups actually mean. And that's kind of a good point. Because on this side, we're talking about how digitalization has changed finance forever. And, you know, you're the guy with a financial background and who's had several hedge funds. But one thing I was always taught was that, you know, plenty of these funds operate with the informational advantage. And now with information being so flat with these Discord channels and subreddits, um, a lot of those advantages can be, you know, kind of smashed relatively quickly. That information can be uh, shared in an instant with the internet. Um, and then kind of what you were highlighting earlier is that investors are saturated by information and ideas. And so where before having information that others weren't privy to was an advantage, it's almost like everyone now has the same information, but a lot of it conflicts. And so it would seem to me as a technical person uh, in this world, that this is how a lot of the managers and financial professionals should look at it. Like you spoke about earlier, uh, there's so many confusing sources. The filter is the most important. And I would say a lot of uh, managers and financial professionals can now act as a trusted filter. What are your thoughts on um, how crowdsourcing is flattening ideas? I know you kind of had some doubts but we've had some some pretty good examples uh, like AMC, like Dogecoin, Shiba Inu, um, a lot of this crypto stuff. So what are, what are your thoughts on uh, the crowd, the power of the crowd uh, operating in financial markets? So I, I think the crowd can get it wrong, um, you know, sometimes. Um, but I do believe there's wisdom in crowds as well. Uh, but crowds are definitely known to get things wrong. And in the investment world, an excellent example is chasing uh, returns, right? A lot of times somebody starts to get good returns and then every investor on the planet chases into uh, a specific you know, trade or a specific uh, investment fund manager. Um, and the unwind of it is usually ugly. Uh, so crowdsourcing has its value in sharing ideas. It's definitely a, a real thing. Um, I like how, you know, you talk about, you know, these, these Reddit forums and how, um, you know, some of the retail investors banded together using technology to overwhelm a couple of very large hedge funds, um, you know, because that is in essence what, you know, what we saw happen over the last 12 months. And, um, you know, this is a true story. My kids have been given brokerage accounts. Um, I taught them to trade at a young age. And um, so they started that process. And, you know, three kids, uh, their first trades were one chose Walmart, one chose Microsoft, one chose uh, GameStop. Um, the one that chose GameStop bought it at 40, wrote it down to two and a half dollars a share. And then, um, you know, somebody told me it was at 70. I asked, hey, did they do a reverse split? You know, how is it at 70 bucks? It's a bankrupted company. Uh, the fact that it still is trading a, 
you know, at these levels is completely in, insane. Um, so I guess it's a real thing. And, um, you know, this sort of gets into how experience can um, be a disadvantage in, in some in some cases. Um, but again, there's so much information out there that when you have education, you have experience, you feel overwhelmed um, being able to process it. And so what, if, make what sense. about the, um, I'm sorry. No, 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 go for it. So you talk about um, kind of how experience will have you not necessarily able to capitalize on these opportunities. We met a gentleman during the Bitcoin conference down here in Miami who told us he had invested $1,500 in Dogecoin, and it was at that time worth what was it about forty million dollars? No, it was, he said eighteen hundred bucks, and it gave him, and that was in two thousand seventeen. He said yeah. it gave him eighty one million coins. By the way, I bought some Shiba Inu, <laughs> nice, just just for fun. Nice. I've got seven hundred thousand coins, so um, I spent twenty bucks on them. Nice. There's a. There's actually um, in, you know, in the float, the coins out in the, that are in the float, uh, there's 365 trillion Shiba Inu <laughs> coins. Um, I'm doing these things just to, I guess, <laughs> for entertainment purposes. Right. Um, I got to experience a little of what I consider complete insanity. Um I was not the person during, you know, when I first came into investing and, and trading, I couldn't understand why the, what I was being taught in finance class in college was saying one thing and publicly traded markets were saying something completely different and it didn't make any sense to me. So I had a hard time grasping it then. So now with 20, you know, plus years of experience in this, this world, um, I feel lost, right? I feel completely lost. So I don't think I'm alone. I think there's a lot of people that are lost. Uh, and I think the more experience and more formal education you have, maybe the more lost you feel. Um, so I, I do believe that entertainment is now part of um, the democratization of investing for the middle class. You know, wealthy people wanted to have fun investing, you know, for a long time. The middle class didn't have that leisure. So... Oh, yeah. so yeah, I mean, on, on, on that note, I mean, it, it brings up this, this next slide, which is the rise of platforms. And this is what I call the Amazon effect. It's platforms, it's commoditization of the specific investment. It's the adding of the fun. I mean, people have fun shopping on Amazon. I mean, you go in there, there's things scrolling left and right. It's sales, it's lots of choice. It's almost like a game show right? It's almost like price is right to some degree. Um, and so the rise of the platforms is something it was, you know, I think it really, they really took off during um, the last year and a half. And now you've got a platform for everything, artwork, uh, collectibles, sports cards, purses, watches, wine, I mean, everything. And, you know, whether financial professionals take these serious or not, I think that this is the bottom up or an example of the bottom up trend that I think is going to infect everything. I've even seen a platform for private equity. And to your point, one of these things, one of the aspects of these platforms are they're fun. They feel like a game. They, while you know it's serious and you know it's real money, they have social aspects to them. And they also capture, like what you said, things that the rich used to only invest in, which was Jeremy, wild. how many, how many different platforms, how many of these different things have you invested in? So I'm addicted to them. So I've, I'm on Rally Road, Acre Trader, Masterworks, uh, Republic, um, Fun, Fun Rise. 
um amber which is like a hedge fund uh there's several crypto ones so anytime a new one comes out i part of my education is to invest in them so i can understand i always thought they were really great i'm a big proponent of making investing more approachable for everybody you know like i try to teach everybody i know that investing is not scary it's something you should be doing as a responsible person and I think these platforms are great ways to get people involved. And as people get involved and they see that they're making real returns, as they make more money, they're going to be able to invest more money. Um, so some of the effects are the, uh, I think it makes the customers feel like they're much more knowledgeable. I think it also helps the regular Joe to start thinking from the perspective of that they shouldn't just consume, they should also invest. How did you get started? How'd you get started? Like, what, tell us about the first. The first trade one was actually on one, uh, on one of these platforms. So the first one was Masterworks. They had done a lot of advertising on social media, and they got me with the compelling piece. Well, you've always heard about investing in artwork. Now you can do it, and so I was like, "Wow!" That actually, before I would say crypto opened the door for me. I had decided about five, well, about ten years ago, I really wanted to get serious about investing. Um, about five years ago, I really started getting serious and I would, I had a TD Ameritrade account. Uh, I got good returns, you know, 15, 20%. And so then I was like, at about 2017, I got into crypto because I was like, I really, you know, this is a new technology. I understand technology. I like investing. Let me get into it. I got in, that was when the, the bull run in Bitcoin, um, where it really started to take off. And kind of as that was ending, I started to see like Masterworks and all of these other platforms. And I guess what crypto kicked the door in was you could invest it, could invest at very low prices. And from that, there were these apps like Acorn and Fundrise and Masterworks. Most of the initial apps were to, to buy stocks. Uh, I think crypto helped people to understand with me that you can invest in other things. And then seeing Masterworks, I was like, wow, you can invest in art. And then I saw Fundrise. Oh, you can invest in $10 increments in real estate. And so that's how I got in. And what so it's, left it's, a, it's really interesting because one of the notes that I made for today's presentation is, um, you know, traditional versus new, uh, old versus new. Um, these platforms are sort of, I consider them a hybrid in, in between traditional in cryptocurrency, yeah, right? Yeah. Like some of the ones you mentioned today are actually clients of ours. They're members of Flyer. Um, they've been on our platform for a couple of years, um, you know, getting exposure. And it's really interesting. Um, they basically, I think, are a lot better at marketing themselves than traditional hedge fund managers. Um, and the reason that they're better is similar um, to how some financial advisors are better than, than others. Um, so a fund manager is going to tell you how great he is uh -huh. and how impressive his track record is. Right. Uh, um, a platform is going to sell you on the niche right. and why it's a good niche to be invested in and why it's safer and it offers the better risk adjusted returns. And they're gonna tell you all the benefits of their, that specific type of investment style. And they're not gonna to try to sell you necessarily on their personal track record and who they are as an investor. Um, so this is kind of a point that we have all the time, which I think this, this hits on two points. Uh, the first point is going back to the million followers versus the Harvard degree. The traditional fund manager is selling pedigree and exclusivity. These platforms are selling ubiquity and that anyone can join. And this is also, we kind of talk about the world going from the East Coast, New York style of America to this more West Coast style, Google style of America. I think is all of these are analogies of the same thing. I think we're in a world that's more welcoming and more relaxed and less formal and more accepting of people coming in all shapes and sizes, which is what digitalization has done. And I think these platforms are riding on that trend and they're bringing in people that previously weren't technically good enough for finance. <laughs> Some of them have pedigrees too though. Absolutely. 
but they rely more on the invest the merits of the investment strategy right and less on uh pedigree less on um you know the, their personal formal education and more of you know hey this is why this asset class performs and we're not trying to sell you on you know like one project versus another project or one loan versus another loan just take exposure to the broader asset class right. um, because it does well over time and by doing it through this vehicle uh, you mr middle class can get exposure to commercial real estate loans that jp morgan's been making for 150 years right something like that yeah now you talk to a lot of people each week. I listen to your conversations. Yep. Um, I'm talking to a lot of the same people. Um, who would you say is better at marketing, hedge fund manager, or a platform guy? A, a, a private equity. Market. Let's go fund manager. Fund manager, whether it's a real asset like real yep. estate or, um, you know a uh a, one of these platform guys without a doubt platform guys more data uh a greater focus on user experience uh, probably because they have more data um but i think because they're thinking more mass market so they understand the importance of ease of use and then education while i think a lot of real estate uh managers they're going to speak technically, which is good. And it holds its place. Yo, we may have just hit on why people are here today listening to us. Yeah. Is we're, we're talking about how to stand out yep. in the attention economy. And I guess one of the secret ingredients that we, we have that, to be honest with you, we, we haven't said it until the words just came out of your mouth uh -huh. is education. Right. Education's king. Yep. Right. And not not selling some investment product. Right. Uh, so like even though it's you know mostly illegal to solicit a security, um, your effectiveness is nowhere near as potent as if you focus on educating people and being the expert inside of that niche. Well, is think that, about uh, a fair statement. I think so, but think about who were some of the best salesmen in your early life. They were your teachers. They literally were selling you on a worldview because they were teaching you about concepts. So if your first economics professor had a particular bent, they sold you on that bent because, or that philosophy, because they taught you about it. And so I think education is like the best method to earn trust and to sell somebody something when the time is right. So here's another interesting thing. Um, so you want to move on from that, huh? You well, I think you, you we, want to go into the expansion of alternative investments. This mm -hmm. is what really excites you. Some of these people with these platforms obviously caught your attention. <laughs> well, again, and, and it goes, it's the same point. Where are those kicks? You got to show a picture of those new <laughs> kicks that you have. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, do you, do you got them with you? I do. Let me pull them up on the, I don't have them on me, but let me pull up the, uh, the, uh, a picture on Instagram. So and, talk about StockX. I, cause well, stock, I, okay. I think that's ridiculous. I, I personally. Here's a pair of the custom sneakers that I got designed. So StockX. I like is, those. Thank you is a marketplace, a stock market. Who's the artist? Who's the artist? Uh, that... It's an it's a actual local artist named uh, Cecilia uh, Pena who did the sneakers for me. So you should, you should give her, her website out. I think she did a fantastic job on those. She's working. I've never met her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely give it out. It's um, Cecilia. I don't want to butcher it, but let me tell you her Instagram which is right here. It's uh, for everyone who can see my camera and I'll put it in the notes, but yeah, go check out her work. She does amazing it's not, work. It's hard, it's hard to see, but. We'll put it in the, um, 
We'll put it in, in the, the chat. Notes. Throw it in the chat. Throw it in the chat. Follow, follow up. All right. I didn't mean to to disrupt you, get you off off your game here. <laughs> um, but this seems like a wish list. I didn't expect pocketbooks to show up. Right. So the definition of alternatives are changing. You said entertainment. Uh, by it becoming accessible to the middle class, um, and with all this hoarding that happened during COVID. Um, I think a lot of things that were perceived as consumable, consumables or consumer items through online methods have now become assets. So StockX is a sneaker stock market where the Yeezys, for example, the, kind, the shoes that Kanye West has designed, they sell for retail for 250 bucks. On the site, there's a chart mapping the price by the day where they're going for $1,200 in different colors and sizes. Are those used or brand new? I, I believe they're brand new. People buy them and save them. And then there's a buy sell bot, uh, buttons with bid ass spreads. On by, the by the way, I, I use StockX to buy my son a pair of uh, sneakers that he wanted. Um, you know, it's not a very efficient process, but um, it worked. I got the shoes that he wanted. And, um, you know, it took like, probably 10 days uh they 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 get possession from the seller they inspect them before they come out to you so um i have used stock x and they're constantly advertised them to me so i think um as you you hinted the middle class is now able to in their minds invest like the rich do you have any any stock any um do you have any funds any platforms that or like to mention the the or part of flyer like I, oh. I think you got a wine a wine company right yeah we have a cult wine is coming up um so we're excited to hear from them um is that a painting is that a painting this is a there? painting so that's a, like masterworks that's masterworks. actually um a rothko which you know is one of the highest selling paintings uh no basquiatis on masterworks platform um i love i love um masterworks and I'll, I'll tell you why when i was at ubs ubs is the um the sponsor the largest the top sponsor of art basel um they sp sponsor art basel in switzerland so when when they started art basel in miami in 2002 uh you know i was involved in that through ubs and uh, i've been involved ever since and um masterworks is definitely reminds me of that. Um, I, I once had Kali Schweitzer, the global president of UBS Art Banking, uh, do a presentation in 2005, um, you know, art as a, an asset class. Uh -huh. And, you know, that definitely was not for the middle class. Right. Um, so Masterworks is, if you haven't checked out Masterworks, they're really cool. Um, it's entertaining and there's upside returns you know there's cuban pete um cuban pete has a million baseball cards uh -huh. i i told him he should be um monetizing his baseball card collection you know so if you have collectibles today i think uh putting them into you know some of these structures is definitely the um uh, the smartest thing that you can do. And for those that are good investors and good at selecting, you know, one over the other, or which one's going to be hot, um, you know, those, those NFTs, uh, some of these different funds that you've got listed here, these are alternative asset classes. These are definitely niche. <laughs> right. This is, this is what I would call frontier alternative investments. And there's and, funds forming around them. This fun starting up. Yep. So, so is it dangerous to have fun investing? I don't think it's dangerous to have fun investing. Um, I think you need to be smart. I think you have to get better with your due diligence process. I think you have to remember while you're here is to earn a return. But these, like you said, are true alternatives. I mean, so much of what has been marketed as alternatives like bonds is very correlated to the market. 
And these are things, women are always gonna buy purses. People are always gonna drink wine. People are always gonna listen to music. I would posit people are gonna drink more wine and listen to more music in depressed times. Um, you know, so these are true alternatives that are connected to human behavior and through digital methods because the cost can come down on transactions and storage. Uh, now you have liquid or more liquid markets. And so these things can exist. So, um, so, so basically what you're saying is how to stand out is possibly look for alternative asset classes. Like or at wine least learn. and whiskey and, and stuff like stuff like that. Because if you're looking at it from the investor's perspective, right? Yep. Um, you know, you want things that are going to appreciate in value. If you're looking at it from the asset manager, you want things that are going to appreciate in value, but you also have to raise the money. Right. Right. You have to raise the money. So, um, you know, you got sort of like two jobs there. Uh, so, with the investments like side, um, being able to look at some of these alternative uh, and asset classes, uh, and then think about what happens when you bring a larger group of buyers uh, into the space, or instead of buyers, investors investing into the space, what's gonna happen to the value of those assets, it's gonna go up. Um, and then from the asset manager side, you get the, that same, you know, appreciation of the underlying investment, but you also have a pretty hot story to tell. No, but the other thing is you said frontier, from my viewpoint, it's not as frontier because look at your son, what is his currency? Like, what are the things the next generation values? And you know, we were kind of talking about it. I, I feel like a lot of people in their 50s, when you're 50 and 60, <laughs> you want to be like your 25-year-old version of yourself, right? But you have the capital to actually live the life that you couldn't afford then. Listen, so anybody who's in finance <laughs> is going to disagree with you trying to make an argument that sneakers, pocketbooks, paintings, wine, are not frontier alternative investments, but that is the value of today's masterclass. And yeah. this is what I learned from you on a daily basis. So I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> no. But, but I you, think you're basically saying that the younger generation use different currency than yes than older people. Absolutely. Because the older generation where they viewed Mercedes and status symbols uh, through items like that, I think the younger generation values sneakers, uh, access to certain types of art, NFTs, crypto, alcohol. Um, they, they view these things. I mean, music is so important to young people. And now what you're, when you have like NFTs, an artist can go directly to their own audience, cut out the middleman, use the traditional um, distribution sources like YouTube and TikTok to distribute and get attention, but the ownership can be shared with their audience through an NFT. Like we're at the, the beginning of like artist rights changing and them being able to sell a piece of the ownership to their fans. And so the youngsters love going to festivals. Well, when they can now use some type of NFT to get exclusive access to the artist and that gains in value. Like this guy, Gary Vanderchuk is doing something really cool where he's selling time with him through an NFT. And it might be entitled you to 10 times to meet with him. Well, you can go out and lease one of the 10 times to somebody else. And as he gains in popularity, so does his time, but you bought that through an NFT and you can lease it out I mean, there's just all types of new ways uh, to look at assets because we're in a digital world. So, so let's talk about networks because okay. that's one of the terms that you use to um, assign value to right. some of these things that I don't understand. All right. Um, you're, you're saying networks is basically the value in these um, these digital economies. 
So for example, let's just say Wikipedia. Can anyone argue that Wikipedia doesn't have value? I mean, it has immense value, but it doesn't currently have a mechanism to demonstrate its value. If you put a crypto uh, token monetize, on it, monetize, monetize its value. Okay. Right. So if you put a crypto token attached to ownership of Wikipedia, that community of maintainers of Wikipedia, by the usage of it, would be receiving a lot of value. It would accrue to the token. So communities have value. That's where information is shared. Uh, if we're in a world where information is so vast, but the filters become more important, communities are nothing but filtration devices of information that give you actionable advice. So there's value. And technology is now allowing that to be captured in tokens um, and NFTs and, and new technologies. So what's the, what's the saying, um, you know, and I'm putting you on the spot. I'm not yeah. sure if you want to say this uh, publicly or not, <laughs> but, um, you know, certain people are uh, benefiting and then uh, the, on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's people benefiting, but the people that are sort of in the middle are not benefiting. What's that saying that you, um, <coughs> the top Some people, the top like a tenth of a percent, yeah, the super, super, super smart people, right? And then the people oh. that can't think, <laughs> oh, yeah, where they show the graph. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's like the high IQ and the low IQ people are getting rich, the high IQ because they can create it, the low IQ because they just blind faith and in the middle, us in the middle, we're thinking too much. So we're like, we're so skeptical that does this work. Yeah, because there's a lot of people out here who are just like, I like sneakers. I'm going to invest in them because I see people wearing them. And then there's people who understand the, the, the niche difference between the thread counts of Nike and Adidas and the, the, the extreme details and they know and can express on a uh, physical level why they're more valuable. And then us in the middle are questioning all of this why those two groups are making all the money. Absolutely. Yeah. Have you seen Golden Gooses? Yeah, I've seen the golden goose. My my daughter hit me up for a pair of those and almost fell on the floor. Like, like seven hundred bucks, right? Seven hundred for sneakers that, that look used. Right? It's all about status. You're paying. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. We're uh, running out of time here. All right. So we've spoken about entertainment, um, the culture economy. So capturing customers' attention is getting more difficult by the day. Uh, entertainment industry uh, reigns supreme in the attention economy. You see a screenshot from Squid Games. I mean, if you hadn't heard about that, you've been living under a rock. I mean, I'm sure for Halloween, they're going to rack up record sales for these costumes. And then in Dubai, they're actually doing a real live Squid Games. Just obviously the people won't be getting killed, but they're doing reenactments. Uh, the Korean uh, tourist board in Dubai is going to do them. Um, so capturing the holding attention, it requires building connections like this. Is, so oftentimes you'll see a lot of these shows after the show is done, a lot of the cast will go online and do a live stream so people get to know them. Uh, it creates this deep connection. And so do you think that the costumes from Squid Games won't be like if someone is a collector and buys some of the costumes, you don't think they'll be worth a lot more money? in the future because it's a, it's a cultural icon? I mean, honestly, I tried to get into it. Um, I couldn't get into it, but I notice that my kids are into it, right? You're talking about it. When I seen it in the presentation, I was a little surprised. <laughs> um, so I, I can't really comment here. I, okay. I, What's well, like at Hard Rock? When we go to Hard Rock, uh, the casino, they have all those costumes in a case from a performance that was at Hard Rock. In 50 years, do you think those costumes are going to be worth the same or going to be worth multiples of what they're worth today? I would say multiples. 
So that's why I say I don't think it's necessarily a frontier market. But they, you know, have a significance. There was certain people that were there at that particular time. You know, I guess one of the ways that you um, describe these networks and their values is how many people can identify, Yeah. you know, with that moment in time or, um, you know, that costume or that icon. And um, it's sort of like my crypto painting. Yes. Right. It's sort of like, uh, why do I buy your maze ties? when we used to wear ties and suits. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, I mean, look, it's, uh, I'm not ready to acquiesce <laughs> to these things not being frontier alternative investments, right? I'm not ready to go there yet because it's still extremely illiquid. Right. There's not a lot of adoption and participation right? It's segmented to very, very small, um, you know, groups of people. Um, even, even crypto still doesn't have mass uh, adoption. I mean, every day I think it makes a little bit of progress, but, um, you know, Bitcoin's concentrated in the hands of, heavily concentrated in the hands of 20 people. Uh-huh. Right. And that's one of the problems with it. And just think about how many people hold Bitcoin. Right. So these other markets are super illiquid, uh, you know, and with the illiquid nature, you got to put some type of frontier label on it. But maybe that's uh, the genius. Maybe that's the genius in you. You're early recognizing the trend, whereas, um, you know, my training and education stopped me. It it blinds me from um, accepting that things have changed. So someone we talked about who I think, and we've had him on our platform, has done a good job of educating, investing, Gets a lot of criticism, though, is a Grant Cardone. I mean, he's found a way to bridge. And whether a person likes him or not, I think there are lessons that can be learned. He has community, he teaches, and he's made investing entertaining. Yeah, he's, um, Grant is uh, an interesting character. Um you know, he invests in a very safe asset, right? Um, And he does it in, like you're saying, a community format, a community style. Um, He is entertaining. He does provide people who may be bored and rich with um, something to do, right? Uh And he raises a lot of money and he raises it from a large number of people. Uh, He's got a very powerful uh, machine that he's built up um, and it's very effective. And, you know, I think there's a lot of money managers out there that are envious of Grant uh, for his ability to uh, raise capital. Um, So, Um, They may not be envious about how he deploys it, but they definitely are envious on, you know, the fact he's not beholden to one institutional investor, that he has, you know, thousands of investors and those thousands of investors, um, you know, they, they can't individually upset his entire business model, right? He's got to do something wrong and get uh, you know, a, a big group of them against them to really impact his business. Um, but yeah, I think that's an excellent uh, analogy to, to bring up. So we got about five minutes left. So just kind of blow through the rest and want to be uh, good stewards of everyone's time. Uh, here's an example of a couple of the platforms who've all are members of 
our site um, and, and just look at the marketing, you know, Masterworks, demystifying and democratizing. And they've got all the cool pop art, you know, Acre Traders got rows of corn, ground floor, you know, it's fun. The user experience is nice. Something else uh, we just recently saw is Yield Street. There, you know, like you you kind of called it, they're doing like more NASCAR effects. Like who would ever thought an alternative investment platform is now the official alternative investment platform of the New York Giants, you know? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so you got to tap into emotion. Right. If you only use the um, left side of the brain, the analytical side of the brain, um, it's going to be hard to differentiate yourself and uh, raise money. Um, you know, as an investor, it usually was not a good thing. Um, you know, when you're making an investment based on emotion, um, I guess you got to be able to do, you know, due diligence while being entertained, right? Uh, that's the key. Yield Street's a cool platform. Uh -huh. um, you know, I knew the, uh, the founder and chairman of it. They raised a, a lot of uh, capital. Um, but when I saw this today, I was shocked. Like the, <laughs> the New York Giants made it official. Yield Street is the alternative investment platform of the New York Giants. Unless you know, alts are mainstream now. You know, so tapping, tapping into emotion <laughs> is definitely a way to, to set yourself aside. Um, it's, it's turning investing into something that's, you know, more than investing. It's turning in, investing into entertainment. Right? So in conclusion. Uh, identify. Sorry. No, no, no. I think you nailed it. I mean, in conclusion, it's... Uh, the digital revolution has changed everything um, at speeds never seen before. Finance is now fun. It's a consumer product. Connection is how to sell. Uh, people may not like where it's going, but they're going to have to adapt. <laughs> it's just the truth. I mean, if, I mean, you know, if you can see my face <laughs> as you're saying that, I'm cringing. I'm absolutely cringing inside <laughs> when I hear you say what you're saying. Um, because it's contrary to all your training, I'm sure. It's a consumer product. You know, we had a conversation. This conversation basically was like, you know, there was a lot of people who invested, you know, and they got, you know, good returns during bull markets. And then, you know, we get into a bear market, the market tanks, and they're left with a 40, 50, 60% hole chasing tech stocks. And they're disappointed and they don't want to invest anymore. Right. So I guess uh, two things. One is, you know, you may go through that same experience again, but at least you'll have fun doing it. Right. That's number one. Uh, number two, I'm just going to leave you with a quick story. A movie director approached me um, for funding on a movie. I asked him how his previous movies had done. He said, yeah, they did good. And I've had some billionaires. He gave me, um, a reference to a billionaire, I set up a call to speak to the guy and ask him what his experience was investing in his movies. And he just frankly told me, uh, I didn't really get my money back, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna leave you with that. Well, we'd like to thank everybody for giving us an hour today. Um, if you got any questions, you know where to hit us up, michael at flyer.org or jeremy at flyer.org. Uh, we'll be doing more presentations on this topic. Um, we love educating. Um, it's how we build a connection with you. Uh, if you have any questions about how we can help you out, like I said, hit us up with those emails. We will gladly help you out. Thank you so much.